this episode of Trial Story, a young actress is stalked and killed, gunned down by an obsessed fan. The defense says Bardo shouldn't be held responsible. Robert Bardo, too, is a victim. But the prosecution says its obsession turned to murder. Where is the evidence of delusion? From opening statements to the verdict, next on Trial Story, the Hollywood stalker, the trial of Robert John Bardo. Hello, I'm Fred Graham. Television has an enormous impact on all aspects of our society. For most of us, it provides a pleasant opportunity for entertainment. But for some viewers, its impact can be overwhelming as the line between fiction and reality begins to disappear. For a few starstruck fans, at some point, fantasizing becomes obsession, and for some, obsession becomes insanity. Occasionally, through some perverse logic, the obsessed fan begins to stalk the object of his obsession and is eventually driven to kill. There was a time when legions of teenage girls screamed for the Beatles, declaring undying love for their favorite member of the group. But in 1980, an obsessed fan gunned down former Beatle John Lennon just outside his New York City apartment building. A few years later, John Hinckley Jr. set out to impress actress Jodie Foster by attempting to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. Hinckley said he'd been inspired by the plot of her movie, Taxi Driver. So when another obsessed young man fell in love with an actress he'd seen only on television, history had already demonstrated that elements of tragedy could be present. Although he was once a straight-A student, Robert Bardo dropped out of Tucson's Pueblo High School and worked as a janitor in fast food restaurants. Around his neighborhood, Bardo became known as something of a troublemaker, three times arrested by the police, though never formally convicted. He lived in this home with his parents and six brothers and sisters. Bardo first became interested in Rebecca Schaefer in 1986 after seeing her in a commercial for My Sister Sam. At some point, admiration turned to obsession as Bardo began videotaping each and every episode of the show. In an attempt to meet the actress, Robert Bardo wrote countless fan letters in which he called himself a sensitive guy and quoted lyrics written by John Lennon. Since Rebecca Schaefer responded by sending him a photograph and a personalized note, Bardo may have taken this as a sign that she was interested in him. So he took a few trips to Los Angeles in futile attempts to find her. Bardo next hired a private investigator in Tucson, who for $250 obtained Rebecca Schaefer's home address from the California Department of Motor Vehicles. That was the information that Robert Bardo, age 19, needed to find Rebecca Schaefer. While attending high school in Portland, Oregon, Rebecca Schaefer had talked of becoming a rabbi. But by the end of her junior year, she decided to move to New York City to pursue a modeling and acting career. She landed a small role in Woody Allen's Radio Days, as well as one in Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. In 1986, she auditioned for a new television series, got the part, and moved to Los Angeles. Hi. Hey, hey guys. Hey, Listen, I've been working on a new speech, and it's pretty good, but it still needs a little bit of work. From 1986 through 1988, Rebecca Schaefer co-starred in the popular sitcom My Sister Sam. She moved in with co-star Pam Dauber until she found her own apartment. Schaefer played Patty Russell, the younger sister of Dauber's character. She was the image of the sweet, innocent girl next door. She appeared to be living a Hollywood dream. On the morning of July 18, 1989, Rebecca Schaefer faced a major opportunity of her young life. She was scheduled to read for a part in Francis Ford Coppola's film, Godfather III, but she never made it to that audition. That morning, someone rang the doorbell of her West Hollywood apartment. Schaefer opened the door, was shot once in the chest, and lived only long enough to cry out, why, why? Rebecca Schaefer was only 21 years old. Within hours, Robert Bardo confessed to police that he shot and killed Rebecca Schaefer. He went on trial for first degree murder in Superior Court in Los Angeles two years later. Join us now as we present a trial that examines the tangled issues of insanity, criminal responsibility, and obsession. The crucial question, 
To what degree was Robert Bardo, in his obviously disturbed mental state, responsible for his own actions? If Bardo purposely planned Rebecca Schaefer's killing, he could be found guilty of first-degree murder, possibly facing life in prison without possibility of parole. But if Bardo was so deranged that he was incapable of planning her death, he might be found guilty of a lesser charge, like manslaughter, which carries a sentence of 3 to 11 years in prison. The case came to trial in September of 1991 before Superior Court Judge Dino Fulgoni, who's reputed to be one of the top legal experts on psychiatric evidence in the state of California. Bardo waived his right to trial by jury, and in exchange, Prosecutor Marcia Clark agreed not to seek the death penalty. Clark has tried dozens of murder cases in her 11 years at the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. Her strategy this time to chronicle Robert Bardo's obsession and prove that the murder of the promising young actress was premeditated. The defense attorney is Steve Galindo, a veteran public defender. His aim was to prove that Bardo was so blinded by obsession that he could not have planned Rebecca Schaefer's death and therefore could not be guilty of first-degree murder. Sitting in the courtroom throughout this trial are Rebecca Schaefer's parents, grandparents, and some close friends. Dana Schaefer learned of the death of her only child when she returned a phone call from one of Rebecca's friends. She still carries around the phone bill for that day, the one listing that moment on July 18, 1989, when her family's life changed forever. People call Mr. Jack Egger. Prosecutor Clark opens the state's case by calling Jack Egger, director of studio protection, head of security at Warner Brothers. On uh, June the 2nd, 1987, uh, my, the, our guard uh, at the ranch gate called me and said, no, oh, pardon me, he called my secretary first and said, there's a fellow here that's been here lots of times who has a large bouquet and about a five-foot teddy bear, and he's left it with us, and he wants us to deliver it to Rebecca Schaefer. Uh, what should we do? And knowing that this individual had called numerous times and been referred to us by the production company of my sister Sam because he called them so many times, I said, pack up the teddy bear, the flowers, and Bardo and him and bring him to my office. I want to talk to him. So the name he gave at that time was Robert Bardo? Yes. Would you please tell me in context of all the people that you've seen in the scope and course of your duties at the Burbank Studios and I'm talking about the people that you come in contact with that are interested in seeking out celebrities on the lot how does Mr. Bardo compare? He was one of the most lucid and uh, uh, intelligent uh, types of people that I've dealt with Did he seem calm to you? Yes. When he indicated to you that he had no previous psychiatric background, did you have any cause in what you saw in his behavior with you to doubt that? None whatsoever. I proceeded to uh, tell him that the best thing for him to do would be to uh, stay away from the studio and not try to get near Rebecca Schaefer. And I offered, I said, how did you get out here today from Hollywood? And he said, I came out on the bus. I said, well, I don't want to see you go back on the bus with that five-foot teddy bear and all those flowers. So how would it be if I drove you back to Hollywood to your place? And he said, great, would you? And I said, yes, I would. And I proceeded to put him in my a company vehicle that I drove. And I drove him back to his place on Whitley Street in Hollywood, dropped him off. Had and you ever, I, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I had an additional conversation in the car with him. And what was the nature of that conversation? Well, I told him that I thought the best thing he could do would be to go back to Tucson where he came from. I, I tried to talk to him like uh, a friend or an uncle or something because he was a young fellow. I believe he was 19 at the time. And uh, he said, I'm going to do that. And thank, he thanked me very much when he got out. And uh, all in all, it was a fairly... For what it was, it was a pleasant uh, encounter, and I felt that I'd accomplished something by getting this fellow to 
agree to leave town. So you felt that you had gotten him straightened away and he wasn't going to come back? Yes. The prosecution is beginning to build its case that Robert Bardo stalked Rebecca Schaefer and planned her death. But on cross-examination, the defense questions Edgar about whether he's qualified to determine Robert Bardo's state of mind. You don't profess to have any expertise, do you, as far as determining or identifying people that may be suffering from some sort of mental illness or another? No, I don't have a particular expertise, no. How would you define schizophrenia, if I were to ask you? Well, it's a split personality is the best I can do on that one. And based on your training with the police department and your experience and years of talking to people, what is the analysis that you undergo to make that determination when you're speaking to somebody? You're beyond me. Many of the calls to my sister Sam were fielded by Mimi Weber. She was Pam Dauber's personal manager and the executive consultant to the TV series. The first call from Bardo came nearly two years before Rebecca Schaefer was killed. He asked for Rebecca. I told him she wasn't there. He left a number for her to return a call. He then called again at 11.05 and professed that he was a very good friend of hers and it was urgent that I get this message to her. I then called the number that he left and there was no such person there. However, I thought I had better tell Rebecca. I called Rebecca at 11.34 uh, and told her about the calls. And she said, I don't know anybody by that name. As Prosecutor Marcia Clark presents her case, she concentrates on proving that Bardo planned Rebecca Schaefer's death. First, Bardo had to locate Schaefer. When he wasn't able to find her address on his own, he turned to the Yellow Pages, called the Anthony Detective Agency, and made an appointment to see Anthony Zinkus. Can you tell me approximately how many contacts you had with the defendant pertaining to locating Rebecca Schaefer? About 10. Zinkus testifies that Bardo hired him to find Rebecca Schaefer's birth date and home address in May of 1989, two months before the murder. Clark then asks about the defendant's mental condition at the time. During the course of your conversations with Mr. Bardo over the 10 contacts you indicated you had, was there ever any indication to you that he was violent or posed any menace or threat to yourself or the party he was trying to locate? None. At all times, was your conversation or the tenor of your conversation polite? Yes, it was. Did you ever become concerned about his mental stability? No. And there was nothing I take it in his behavior that caused you to have any concern about uh, giving him the information he was requesting? No, there wasn't. I have nothing further. But on cross-examination, defense attorney Galindo tries again to cast doubt on the prosecution's claim that Robert Bardo plotted the murder. Did he ever hide his identity? In other words, did he ever claim to be someone other than Robert Bardo? No. He told you where he lived, did he not? Yes. He never hid anything about his uh, personal identifying information. Isn't that true? Not that I could detect. As Rebecca Schaefer's family looks on, the state calls the first of four members of the Bardo family that will be called to testify. Edward Bardo. Edward Bardo is Robert's older brother. The prosecution hopes he'll reveal the extent of Robert Bardo's obsession. Did you become aware at some point that your brother was interested in the actress starring in My Sister Sam? Yes, I did. About a month before, or excuse me, I'm sorry, about two months before the murder occurred, did you see him looking through the yellow pages to locate a private detective? I believe I did. And about a month before the murder occurred, did the defendant tell you that he had in fact hired a private detective to find Rebecca Schaefer? I believe he did. And did he tell you that he had paid a few hundred dollars for that service? I believe so. Edward Bardo testifies that he purchased a 357 Magnum for his underage brother after Robert told him he was interested in target practice. Were you aware that he had, the defendant had gone to Los Angeles several times before to see celebrities? Yes, I was. Had he ever indicated to you a desire to take the gun to Los Angeles on previous occasions? He gave some indications that I inferred suggested that. So, I mean, in a roundabout way, yes, he did. 
when he indicated that desire to take the gun to Los Angeles with him, did you inform him of anything? Yes, I informed him of the law that transporting a weapon like that would be illegal, and I told him not to take the weapon. And did he agree not to do so? Yes, he did. Did he tell you that he was going to Los Angeles? I believe he did. And his father was, your father, was taking him to the bus station? Yes, he was. Was the defendant's behavior unusual in any respect at that time? No, not really. Did he seem calm, rational? Yes, he did. Nothing out of the norm? Nothing. Did you have any idea that he had the gun on him at the time he left? No, I did not. Shortly after he left, did you look to see if the gun was still in its place in the closet? I believe I did. And what did you find? I found the gun missing. Did you attempt to look for it? Yes, I did. Did you ever see the gun again? No, I didn't. So the last time you saw the gun was on the Sunday before the defendant left for Los Angeles in 1989. That would be approximately July 16th of 1989. Yes, I believe that's correct. I have nothing further. While the prosecutor is using Edward Bardo to prove that his own brother planned the murder, Defense attorney Steve Galindo takes the opportunity to make a few points of his own. Under cross-examination, Edward Bardo was asked about his brother's behavior. On this particular occasion, on the last trip to Los Angeles, the district attorney asked you if he appeared to be rational at the time. You remember that question? Yes, I do. Did he ever appear to you to be irrational during the periods of time that we're discussing here? You understand that question? Yes, I do. He. Uh, no, he didn't. It would have struck me as odd if he had acted in any way rationally. Okay. Now, were you aware that, or did you discuss the fact that your brother had had bouts with depression and some uh, other, did you discuss some other mental issues with the police when they came to interview you at your home? I might have. Did your brother ever confide in you, Edward? Uh, about these trips that he would take from time to time to Los Angeles? Yes, he did. Prior to your purchase of the gun that we've been discussing, did yes. he ever confide in you that he had taken a trip to Los Angeles and had been uh, robbed and beaten? Yes, he did. Did he ever discuss the issue of a gun as defense uh, for him? Yes, he did. And did he ever discuss the possession of a gun as defense for specific instances such as the time where he had been in Los Angeles and had been robbed and beaten. Yes, he did. In Tucson on the day after Schaefer's killing, police officer John Norton received a report that a young man was acting strangely, walking up and down the exit ramp of the freeway. Officer Norton called police dispatchers and asked them to phone Bardo's parents. What, were you, what did the father say? The dispatcher told me that the father had advised that the defendant might be armed and that he had possibly killed an actress from California. And based on what you heard, sir, what did you do? I immediately went back to him. I had separated from him so he couldn't hear my radio conversations. I immediately went back to him and Officer Oyn and frisked him looking for a weapon. While I was on the radio, he leaned his head on the DPS car and started to sob. And what did you do? I asked him what was wrong, and he said that I had better arrest him now. And I asked him why and what for, and he said, I shot somebody. That admission by Bardo was enough to lead to his arrest by homicide detective Victor Marmion. Afternoon. The detective is called to testify about Robert Bardo's behavior after his arrest. And what was his behavior during the time that you observed him, sir? I watched uh, the defendant uh, every five minutes for approximately an hour and a half. During that one and a half hour period, uh, I went into the interview rooms where he was at on two different occasions. And uh, he was quiet, he, uh, he was calm. Uh, I would describe him as being rational. But that testimony is challenged by the defense. Wouldn't it be fair to say that the, any words spoken by Mr. Bardo to you were minimal? 
Yes. Okay. And in fact, when you make uh, your statement concerning his rationality, it is based on a very limited conversation or statement of words by Mr. Bardo to you. Isn't that true? Uh, it's a very limited conversation, yes. Clark returns for a quick rebuttal. The statements that the defendant made to you, the spontaneous statements he made to you, did they concern uh, his curiosity or interest in the publicity that he was getting? Yes, ma'am, very much so. Thank you. I have nothing further. To prove that Robert Bardo intentionally planned to kill Rebecca Schaefer, the prosecution must partially rely on witnesses to Bardo's behavior that day. Early on the morning of July 18, 1989, one of Rebecca Schaefer's neighbors was on her way to a West Hollywood food market to buy some coffee when she was approached by a stranger. Did you have any kind of unusual experience when you were at Jay's Market on the morning of July 18, 1989? Uh, yes, a man came up to me and uh, stopped me and uh, showed me a picture and asked me if I knew this girl, if I'd seen this girl in the neighborhood. And do you see that man in court today? Yes, I do. Could you please point him out? Right over there. Another neighbor thought it seemed an odd hour for someone to be hanging out on the street. He was acting a little strange. He was patting a bag and he was kind of just moving his head up and down. Looked like he was really thinking about something. I mean, it, he, obviously he didn't see us. He did not appear to be focusing on you? No, he was not focused on me. Did he appear to be lost in thought? Yes. And he was holding on to a bag? Yeah, something. He had a, so I, I think it was a bag. A plastic bag? Yeah, I thought it was a plastic bag. But that wasn't my main focus, that was like a second thought. And he appeared to be patting it? Yeah, he was patting it and just kind of moving his head. He wasn't jerking, but he was moving. As though thinking to himself? Yeah. Was Robert Bardo thinking of murder? Or, as the defense suggests on cross-examination, was he too mentally unstable to be thinking at all? If I were to ask you to identify or to, to actually emulate the head movements of Mr. Bardo at the time you made your observation, how would you do that? How would I demonstrate it? Yes. I would move my head around. Okay, well, I, I want to, for the court, indicate as closely as possible the exact movements that you were observing, Mr. Bardo. Would it be in this fashion, up and down like this? Well, you'd have to start walking also. In any event, we can agree that the movements were uh, back and forth, up and down motion. It was a movement, and his head was maybe moving forward and back. But he was also walking, and that caused his movement also. And during the time that you were observing him, his eyes were fixated towards the floor? No. Where were his eyes? His eyes, well, I don't know exactly where his eyes were, but it's a, he wasn't looking down. He was, you know, kind of moving. Like this, I'd say. And then you add your walking movement. And I believe that your testimony was that he did not appear to be aware of his surroundings. Do you recall that? Yeah, I recall that. He, he, he obviously didn't notice me. Early that same morning, John Corbett delivered a script to Rebecca Schaefer. After you made the delivery, what happened next? Uh, well, I, I proceeded back towards my car. And... Uh, the defendant uh, was calling out to me from across the street and uh, I, you know, try to ignore him and, and just make, go back to my car and uh, I got inside my car and he was still calling to me and trying to get my attention. He asked me if I had seen her around the neighborhood or if I knew that she lived around there or not. Did you respond to him? Uh, yes, I said no, I've never seen her before. Did he ask you another question? Uh, yes. What did he ask you? He asked me if I had just delivered to the uh, apartment building. Rebecca Schaefer's building? Yes. Did you answer him? Uh, I, I believe I said something like uh, that I, I didn't want to answer any more questions. Prosecutor Marcia Clark then calls Robert Bardo's sister, Arlene Weedry. And did you live in the same home with him for 
Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you want to take a minute? We drink tales of how she first learned of Robert Bardo's interest in Rebecca Schaefer. Do you recall uh, your brother showing you a publicity photo, a black and white publicity photo of an actress? Yes. And do you recall who that was? Uh, I didn't know the name at the time, but it was Rebecca Schaefer. Did he tell you something about the, this, this uh, woman shown in the photograph? I believe he said something like she signed it herself or something like that. And he was pleased with that? Yes, he was excited about it. And you remember it was the girl from the TV show, My Sister Sam? Yes. Weedrick then tells of a letter Bardo gave her less than three weeks before the murder. What did you feel upon reading this letter? Uh, I felt that he was upset about something and that he was going to do harm to himself. So you thought the letter posed a suicide threat? Yes. <clears throat> and what specifically caused you to feel that? Just the things that it said in it. Uh, and the, the hint at the bottom about, had uh, dates like on a, on a tombstone. Yes, you're referring to the bottom of the letter where it says, it has, it's encased in two lines. Between the two lines it says, hint, colon, arrow, 1967-1989. Yes. But Robert Bardo was not born in 1967. Rebecca Schaefer was. Weedrick remembers the night she found out the real meaning of the letter. I started screaming and it just was hysterical. And what did you do after that? My husband came downstairs and, and I told him and he started screaming too and then he went to our next door neighbor's house to report it. And you reported it to the police? Yeah, we reported it to our next door neighbor and he got a hold of the police. Had you ever known Robert to be violent or aggressive in your presence? No. I have nothing further. That testimony scored points for the prosecution's case. But on cross-examination, Steve Galindo points to Bardo's frame of mind just hours before the shooting when he called his sister long distance. You've had a chance to reflect on that phone call several times since the incident, correct? Yes. Do you recall now any statement uh, made by your brother on July 18th when he spoke to you on the phone of his intent to meet her or to see her only? I don't recall it. Do you recall any statement by your brother as to his purpose for being there? No. But you do remember, I take it, that there was nothing said there by your brother to indicate that he had any intent to do anything um, as far as harming anyone. Right. Of that, you're clear. Yes. The prosecutor now brings one of its most important witnesses, Rebecca Schaefer's next door neighbor who heard the fatal gunshot. So within about a split second after Rebecca's footsteps passed your door, you heard a blast. Very loud? Very loud. It was like a cannon blast and in this particular hallway, it was extremely loud. What happened next? Oh, um, I dropped my knees because the blast came through the door. It rattled the door and sort of knocked me to my knees and I crawled to the other side of the door and ran to the bedroom and immediately got on the phone and dialed 911. What happened next? What happened is I was on the phone to, nine, to uh, the 911 people and I heard, uh, well actually as I was going into the bedroom I heard the scream, one very loud, long scream. And as I was on the phone, there were more screams. And I mentioned to the people on the phone, can't you hear her screaming in the background? But the defense tries to diffuse that testimony by revealing Marta never actually saw Robert Bardo at the apartment. Did you ever see Robert Bardo loitering in front of the apartment at all? No, I did not. Did you ever see Robert Bardo waiting 
in front or down the street of your apartment house? No, I did not. Did you ever see Robert Bardo in a position where he appeared to you to be watching the apartment house where you lived? No, I did not. Did you ever see Robert Bardo concealing himself or attempting to conceal himself in any fashion? No, I did not. So it's clear that through that entire period of time, you never even observed Robert Bardo anywhere near the apartment house, correct? Correct. Judge Falgoni then interjects with a crucial question. The people Do you remember how long a period of time elapsed between the last footstep that you heard and the shot? Seven seconds. Half a second, a second, it was a very, uh, very brief period of time. Before Marsha Clark wraps up the prosecution's case, she introduces evidence that paints a gruesome picture of murder. A series of photographs of the crime scene, Rebecca Schaefer's blood-drenched robe, and the single bullet shot from a 357 Magnum at close range. A forensic pathologist who examined Schaefer's body testifies it had ripped open the actress's heart. The uh, bullet, uh, as I've noted here and you have asked, uh, caused a large defect in the heart, about two inches, uh, nearly obliterating most of the right side of the heart. With that testimony, the prosecution rests its case, leaving an uphill battle for the defense. A decade ago, a hybrid type of insanity defense known as diminished actuality became popular in California's courts. It's used when a defendant in a murder case isn't mentally disturbed enough to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. In such a case, a defense lawyer can still argue that his client did not have the mental capacity necessary to plan and commit a crime. Diminished actuality, a doctrine almost tailor-made for the defense of Robert Bardo. Would Robert Bardo's attorney be able to convince the judge that his client was so mentally ill that he could not possess the intent to plan and commit murder? Defense attorney Steve Galindo calls Philip Bardo, the defendant's father, a retired Air Force mechanic turned security guard. He tells of a son living in a world all his own. A lot of times we'd go into his room or especially late at part of the evening that he, he'd be in the other room, it'd be dark, he'd have himself back, he wouldn't uh, knock on his door to go in there. He wouldn't in here, he'd go in there, he'd be in bed with pillows around him and then he'd have his uh, music box, a uh, small stereo, and he'd be listening to that and he'd have it enclosed just so he'd be just listening to the music. Philip Bardo testifies that his son so despised noise that he often called the police, that he slept on the roof in shorts in the middle of winter, and that he had an unusual habit. Yeah, a lot of times, and in fact, even uh, even school coming on, he liked to pick his lips a lot peeling the skin and always like that. I've commented it and other people, even his sisters and brothers commented about him always picking his lips. Day in, day, night, anytime. Anytime you see him, he had his fingers going to his lips. He then tells of his son's plans to travel to Los Angeles and meet Rebecca Schaefer. So you were aware of, a, of his plans to travel to Los Angeles to see Rebecca Schaefer, correct? Yes, we, we knew that's where he was going. And then after you watched this movie Lethal Weapon 2 with Robert. On the way home, he advised you that he was going to move up that yeah, day? Yes, that he was going to leave uh, that next day. Did he tell you why he had uh, decided to advance his plans? He said some reason he had, to, he had to go now. After his trip in July of 1989, you became aware of his arrest in relationship to the death of Rebecca Schaefer? The way I caught about it was, uh, we happened to be watching the uh, CNN news, and I heard that Rebecca had been killed. And my first thought, knowing my son had gone to see it, was that we couldn't believe it. But, uh, and then uh, as soon as we heard it, my son went and checked to see if the uh, pistol was still in the house, and then he went searching for it where he had hit it, and the pistol was gone. The defense next calls Robert Bardo's mother. My name is June Bardo. Throughout her testimony, June Bardo wore dark sunglasses. Defense attorney Steve Galindo later told us he thought those glasses revealed a lot about what kind of mother she had been. Did Robert have any girlfriends as far as you know? No. Nope.
did the state of Tucson or their representatives ever come to your home and take Robert out of your home? Yes. Do you remember when that was? 1985. And did they ever place Robert in a hospital? Yes. As further evidence of Bardo's troubled childhood, the defense calls Robert Bardo's counselor from junior high school. He would often be very depressed, not very talkative, very inward. And as I would uh, sit with him and talk, sometimes he would begin to uh, express anger. Um, he would sometimes yell, curse, um, be very upset visibly. Uh, get up, start to leave, return. Sometimes he would, uh, he would be so upset that he would just put his hands in his head and moan. Hickman suggested to Bardo that he write down his thoughts. And it became very apparent to me very early in those writings that he had um, a very low self-esteem and, and um, almost to the point of uh, not even believing that he made mistakes anymore, but that he just was a mistake. Okay, then directing your attention to references <clears throat> where it indicates his writings, Robert Barber's writings, have in general revealed indication of serious emotional disturbance. Is that your information? Yes. Uh -huh. And that's the indication of 21084, Diary of a Madman right. by Scarface, Diary of a Devil by Scarface, Diary of Insanity by the Devil. Yes. Is that your notation? Yes. Uh -huh. And there's notation here about giving specific plans for killing and taking hostages yes. involving a knife and a gun. Those are your notations? Yes. The notations be below. The people at the school did a good job of stopping me from killing myself. They made a mistake because they saved the devil. Now the devil must kill. Is that your notation? Yes. Those are direct quotations from Robert. And then the statement, he states over and over that he is not kidding. Is that your yes. reference? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then in quotations, who cares about punishment? The only punishment is my home. I'm going to be the next Hitler. Right. That's a direct quote. Yes. Hail me, damn you. That's a direct quote. Yes. I rule, I am God, I will make my own society. Yes. Kill, vengeance. Yes. Violence, destruction, kill. These are all his quotations. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Are those quotes from letters he wrote? Yes, wrote those are excerpts from letters. Then defense attorney Galindo asked the witness about a letter which he testifies was a clear cry for help. And it indicates at the top, I'm not able to relax here, semicolon several times, mm -hmm. I have to get away. Right. And then help with semicolons. Mm -hmm. There's a notation there, please do not ignore this. Right. Please don't, I need help now. Mm -hmm. Hickman testifies he stopped counseling Robert Bardo when he was still in junior high because June Bardo refused to cooperate. But can the defense convince the judge that Robert Bardo's childhood was so crippling that he could not have planned a murder? It's not surprising that the key witness for the defense was a noted psychiatrist who had examined, among others, John Hinckley Jr., the man who shot President Reagan. Dr. Park Dietz interviewed the defendant in prison. By January of 84, uh, Robert Bardo had become particularly interested in and had observed to be odd by a teacher in a special class he was in for gifted students, <coughs> that teacher being a Mrs. Morris. He had a tremendous attraction to Mrs. Morris and saw her as a friend, as someone special, as the only one who had been nice to him as someone who had a very special relationship with him. He was noted to have been uh, exceeding the usual bounds of student-teacher propriety in doing such things as suggesting how she should wear her hair or asking her for her home telephone number, which was among the things that caused concern to Mrs. Morris. The relationship, as he perceived it with her, however, changed. And the central event that seemed to change his perception of what he was to Mrs. Morris and what she was to him was an incident in which Mrs. Morris made what he took as an unkind comment about his brother, Jeffrey Bardo. Uh, J 
Jeffrey Bardo, who is also a sick young man, had apparently been described by Mrs. Morris as looking retarded, or words to that effect. And uh, that prompted the defendant to write repeatedly that he was gravely concerned that she might think ill of him, that he was worried that she might talk about him behind his back too, that she might have an unkind thought toward him, that she might not think of him as he wished her to, all of which led him to conclude that she had to die, that he must kill her, that he had to kill someone, he had to kill himself, or he had to kill her, and many people had to die because she might think ill of him. Dr. Dietz revealed that when Robert Bardo was hospitalized in 1984, counselors there said he compared himself to John Hinckley, that he heard voices that told him to kill and complained about life with his family. He likened life in his home to life under Soviet rule, um, according to the psychologist who tested him. He had uh, talked about viewing himself as evil, viewing himself as less intelligent than other classmates, and expressed what Ms. Weber thought might be a paranoid concern over the opinion held of him by another teacher, who would be Mrs. Morris. In answering a test uh, known as the Bloom Sentence Completion Survey that is in the raw test data just given to the district attorney, he filled out partial sentences indicating that his mother and father have frequent arguments, that there are times he wishes he were dead, that his family causes him pain and suffering. Yet, uh, on the very same document, he said that he likes to play the guitar and hopes in the future to be in the world of the successful and to be, quote, a movie star, writer, or musician, maybe all of them, end quote. He also wrote that when he listens to the radio, he is possessed by it. Over the prosecution's objection, the defense played a song from the rock group U2's Joshua Tree album. Until this point in the trial, the defendant had remained composed in the courtroom. But once the song Exit was played, he sang and strummed to the music. Dr. Dietz testified that Bardo told him that lyrics from the song The Pistol Weighed Heavy helped send him on his mission. He told me uh, after describing the meaning of those lyrics that the first effort he made to find, uh, that is to visit Rebecca Schaefer, had been toward the end of May or early June 1987. And he said that he was even thinking of hurting her at that time because she sounded arrogant in TV Guide, but he wanted to see her before she was a big star. In that trip, he had contact, for reasons that get described later, with Jack Egger. He told me uh, that Jack Egger had his men give Robert a tour of the studio before Jack Egger drove Robert back to his hotel, and that after he was dropped at his hotel, he went out and looked for uh, pharmacies or any place else he could buy sleeping pills that he bought some kind of over-the-counter sleeping pill, the name of which he no longer recalls, and that he took the whole uh, container, laying down on the bed with the teddy bear that he had brought for Rebecca Schaefer but had not been allowed to leave for her, that he lay down with the teddy bear to die and instead woke up, now in a bad mood, thinking, she shouldn't have made me feel this way, it should have been easy, end quote. He went to Hollywood Boulevard and he bought a book called The Love You Make by the Beatles, which had a chapter on Mark David Chapman, the man who killed John Lennon. He found some points of similarity between himself and Chapman. They had both been unhappy, both had fathers who were master sergeants in the Air Force, and that he could understand what Chapman did. He again talked about the song Exit that's just been played and quoted the lyric, uh, pistol weighing heavy, heart beating. He said he thought that's what would happen when he first met Rebecca Schaefer. Quote, it's like I love you, but if you're going to be some arrogant kind of person, you're no good anyway, end quote. He read that 
she cried every night for a year because she couldn't make friends and said that he related to that because that's the way he felt. As he was describing conflicts within himself, as he described the shooting itself, he was for the most part emotionless and had a flat emotional appearance. He said he had expected Rebecca Schaefer to be callous, but he wasn't certain whether she would be, that he shifted between expectations she would be sweet and the expectation she would be callous. Dr. Dietz's testimony clearly paints a picture of a troubled man, but was Bardo too disturbed to have planned a murder? With Dietz still on the stand, the defense plays a videotape of an interview Dietz conducted with Bardo in prison. Bardo tells of the chilling moment when he approaches Rebecca Schaefer's doorway. And then I look, I see him, and go the hallway. And I'm through. I was like, so I have this there, and I was like, you know, I was like, there she is, and I don't have to shoot any security guards to get her, and she's right there in front of me, you know, and I, didn't, and I didn't even shoot her, you know, I, the girl was in the back, you know, I was still talking to her, you know, like, she was just a regular person, you know, there was no big security guards, you know, she wasn't dressed up glamorously, like, it's, you know? and I, you know, I was just, you know, I was just, just like this, it's just me and her, you know, that's like what most guys who fantasize about seeing their favorite celebrity, you know, and this was it, it's just me and her, you know, I'm talking to her, you know, I wasn't focusing too much attention on it, but it seemed like she said, uh, you mean to come to my door, just give me a letter, you know, come again, you know? Like, she was, like, I was bothering her, and I thought, I was such an arrogant statement, you know? That, like, she, she was mumbling, she sounded like a little kid, you know? She sounded like a little, she has a kid, like, kid voice, like, right, like, she sounded like a little brat or something. And, you know, I was just wasting, wasting, you know, wasting your time, you know? Like, like, I'm, you know, I mean, I thought that was very calisthenic to say to a fan. I grabbed it with this hand. I grabbed the door. Gun still in the bed. It was drawn. Grabbed, grabbed it on the chair. Like this. The blood hit her hair. Blood squirted out. And she went. She was just screaming. God damn. Screaming my mouth. Ah, I'm screaming, oh my god. And I was like, oh my god, oh fuck, what? You know, like, 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 did I kill her, you know? And she was like screaming, and she was, she, she felt that, she fought me, she was like, oh, she's this, you know, she's constantly doing it. She hit the ground, she, she was going, what? And I was like, looking at her, oh my god, I killed someone, oh no, I, no, I did, oh no. You know, because, you know, no, I can't, no, no, I couldn't pull back the action, I just did, you know? And she was, uh, she was going, uh, why? Why? She's screaming, she's just straight screaming, I was screaming, why? Why? He uh, had said in the earlier part of the interview that he had a stupid reason for pulling the gun, and I asked him what that stupid reason had been, whereupon he said, and this is one of these um, occasions in which I've repeatedly watched the tape to try as best I could to decipher precisely what he said. Quote, it's just like I wasn't sure you know what she was saying and all you know, because maybe I mean it could. I didn't, correction, it didn't have to be that way. I think that the anxiety arose when he saw her dressed in a bathrobe, realized he'd brought her out of the shower and sensed what might be some annoyance at having had her shower interrupted. And the hostility, I believe, was triggered by his perception that she was frankly annoyed with him and saying words to the effect of, you're wasting my time to give me a letter, when to him, the delivery of that letter and the conversation with her was the equivalent of the Holy Grail to, uh, for her to see it as trivial or unimportant was unbearable. But in cross-examination, Prosecutor Marcia Clark challenges Dr. Dietz's findings, arguing that Robert Bardo was sane when he killed Rebecca Schaefer, 
that he planned and committed the murder after hunting down the actress. Isn't it true that even in a clinical setting, a psychiatrist may unwittingly plant a suggestion for a symptom simply by routine admitting procedures, such as do you hear voices, do you have visual hallucinations, do you see things, that sort of thing. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. So if a pr prospective patient is asked whether or not he hears voices, he may well adopt the suggestion and agree that he does, when in fact he does not. That can happen, can it not? It can happen, yes. And there may be a variety of reasons why he'd be so motivated, like the desire for attention, or to please the doctor, or to accommodate what he thinks he should be doing, performing according to plan. Isn't that possible? Yes, it is. And as a matter of fact, with this de defendant in particular, we have a young boy who had vehemently been demanding attention for quite some time, and especially at the time he was admitted. Isn't that true? Yes. You cannot say that when he approached her door the first time that he was operating under a command hallucination, can you? No. And you cannot say that when he left her door the first time he was operating under a command hallucination, can you? No. And you cannot say that when he returned the second time he was operating under a command hallucination, can you? No. And you cannot say that when he shot her he was operating under a command hallucination either, can you? No, I can't, and I didn't. Would you agree that you that a bizarre motivation for killing is not in itself evidence of psychosis or serious mental disorder. I do agree. And wouldn't you agree that other than some notable examples, and I'm just going to throw one out, other than a contract killer, for example, that most people would find the reasons or justifications given for killing to be unacceptable? Yes. So the fact that the defendant may have wanted to kill Rebecca Schaefer if she was arrogant, or because he felt she rejected him is not in itself evidence of a mental disorder or defect, is it? No, that isn't. In fact, wouldn't the shooting of a president to impress an actress appear to be a little bizarre to you? Yes. But you didn't find that Hinckley suffered from a mental disease or defect that precluded his ability to deliberate or plan his actions, did you? No. And in fact, in the Hinckley case, sir, didn't you actually testify that you felt that his goal was indeed reasonable because he achieved it. Language I've since learned to regret, but yes, I did give that testimony. Well, if we refer to your research, isn't it true that you actually found that the real motivation behind these celebrity stalkers, sir, was actually for the fame and notoriety that they would attain? That's a, that's a piece of it. Um, it's the union with something special, important, and famous. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they perceive it as becoming famous themselves. Sometimes it's just as affirmation of the specialness they feel already, so that there's no expectation of external recognition. But there's always something along those lines. Okay. Now this defendant, though, you've read all his writings and, and, and letters to the school counselors and things of that nature. Aren't they fairly permeated with a desire for fame? and attention. Yes, there's quite a bit of that. Wouldn't you agree? Then in this particular case, might it not be fair to say that there was a strong motivation there to attain fame by attachment to a famous figure? I don't know whether he subjectively recognized it as that, but I think that that's one of the motivations underlying this. Okay. Then if you apply that understanding to this particular case, might you not also say that this defendant's goal was indeed also reasonable because he did achieve it? That's a mistake I'm not going to make again. <laughs> that cross-examination was damaging to the defense's case, particularly damaging because Dietz was the defense's best and last witness. Defense attorney Steve Galindo says that Robert Bardo is not guilty of first-degree murder that he was so obsessed with the actress that he suffered from a diminished mental state and therefore was unable to commit premeditated murder. Your Honor, I'd like to start out by saying and acknowledging that Rebecca Schaefer is a victim in the true sense of the word. There's no doubt about that. She did nothing to deserve the fate that befell her. I would like to suggest that Robert Bardo too is a victim, although not to the degree, of course, that Rebecca Schaefer suffered as a victim. 
But nevertheless, I think it's important to point out, or I feel compelled to point out, that in my opinion, he is a victim of parental neglect. He was a victim of a mental health system which was powerless to provide the type of help that he needed. So I would ask the court to focus in on what I think is the main issue in this case. And that is, when Robert Bardo formed the intent to kill Rebecca Schaefer, which we concede he did, was it done under circumstances as defined by our legal fiction of lying in wait? And I suggest to you, with all due respect, that he did not. Lying in wait is not appropriate in this case. The legal fiction of lying in wait does not exist in this case because Robert Bardo formed the intent to kill at the time he perceived Rebecca Schaefer to be arrogant, as he used that term, and at the time he perceived Rebecca Schaefer to be annoyed with him as he approached, as she approached him on the second visit. If that theory is embraced, or if there is a reasonable doubt as to whether or not that statement of facts does exist, he would clearly be entitled to an acquittal of the lying in wait allegation. From the second visit, there was no substantial period of waiting and watching. There was no waiting and watching with the intent to inflict injury. There was no waiting and watching to take Rebecca Schaefer by surprise. There was no waiting and watching for an opportune time to act. Clearly, Your Honor, if Robert's statements or the defense position is valid regarding his lack of intent to injure upon approaching on the second time, there would be a cognizable interruption between the waiting and watching, and there would be no substantial period of waiting and watching. In my opinion, the uncontroverted, unrebutted testimony of Dr. Dietz on this issue alone raises a reasonable doubt as to whether or not Robert Bartle had the required mental state which is necessary for lying in wait. I feel that the evidence is insufficient to establish that he had the mental state that was necessary for lying in wait, that the evidence is more than sufficient to raise a reasonable doubt as to whether or not when he went back that second time he had the intent to kill, and that the medical corroboration, the uncontroverted psychiatric testimony of Dr. Dietz corroborates that theory. I'm telling you that it's my position, whether you agree with me or not, that a fair reading of this evidence, an objective reading of this evidence, in my opinion, is that Robert Bardo is not guilty of first degree murder, is not guilty of having committed that murder while lying in wait, and is guilty only of second degree murder because he had an intent to kill at a time when he did not premeditate and deliberate. But Prosecutor Marsha Clark said that Robert Bardo's obsession led him to commit murder, that he felt rejected by Schaefer, hunted her down, and killed her. Her case depends on convincing the judge that Bardo planned the murder and therefore should be found guilty of first-degree murder. Now, with respect to the testimony of Dr. Dietz, Your Honor, while his credentials were indeed impressive, I felt that when his ultimate conclusions were probed for real evidentiary or factual support, they were revealed to be a gross exaggeration of what could objectively and fairly be said both about this defendant's medical history as well as his mental state at the time of the murder. Well, I don't take issue with the stance that this defendant was not a normal 13-year-old, nor with the notion that he was not a normal 19-year-old. A normal person doesn't stalk and murder a celebrity he's never met. Well, if that's so, Your Honor, as a practical matter, then where is the evidence of delusion? That the defendant deluded himself? into believing that maybe someday Rebecca might be his friend? Well, then haven't we all been guilty of being delusional at some point in our lives? Have we not all held some unrealistic hope or dream? This just shows that the defendant had high hopes, albeit <coughs> perhaps unrealistic. I'm not even sure that I can say that. Because if all he dreamed or hoped of was that she would write back to him someday, is that so unrealistic? She did once. So we might conclude that the defendant was a dreamer. But as the doctor admitted, he testified in the Hinckley case. Having hopes and dreams does not mean one has a serious mental disorder. Finding a song very significant, believing a song relates to you or something you felt in your life is not evidence of psychosis. 
and it is not evidence of delusional or referential thinking. These songs, as I could determine from the doctor's testimony, impelled this defendant to do nothing. Rather, he found it comforting to listen to them when he felt animosity for Rebecca Schaefer. He said he could relate to the lyrics. How many millions of teenagers would say this? The bottom line about these songs that the defendant found significant or that he could relate to <coughs> is that he chose them. Who chose these songs? I pose this question to Dr. Dietz. Who chose the Joshua Tree tape? Who chose Exit? Who chose With or Without You? On each occasion, the doctor said the defendant did. Did voices compel him to do so, I asked? No, no. The defendant chose to do that on his own. The defendant chose these songs because he had an affinity for them like all the rest of us do. Now, lack of nerve clearly does nothing good for the defense position in this case, but unfortunately, it probably is the only correct explanation that objectively encompasses all the evidence. The defendant's lack of nerve becomes the most obviously correct answer to the question of not only why he failed to attack in 1987, but also at least partially why he failed to shoot the first visit in 1989. As described by Dr. Dietz, the defendant's frame of mind concerning Rebecca Schaefer involved at least equal parts of animosity and hatred, along with the admiration and love, as far back as 1987. According to the defendant's statements to Dr. Dietz on the first day of interview, the animosity first surfaced before he ever went to Burbank Studios in June of 1987, when he indicated that in May he read an article in TV Guide that made her sound arrogant and he felt animosity for her. Now, after the first visit that he paid to Burbank Studios in June of 1987, when he got thrown off the lot, that animosity grew substantially, so that after meeting Jack Egger and being tossed off the lot of uh, Burbank Studios, the defendant harbored tremendous hostility against Rebecca Schaefer. And he went back the second time. He actually had the gun in the back of his waistband with his shirt pur pulled over it. The defendant's true intention in returning the second time becomes even more crystal clear than it has been. Putting it all together, he loaded the empty chamber, put the gun in his waistband, went to the door, rang the buzzer, stepped back and waited until Rebecca Schaefer came out onto the porch, stepped up when she came out, grabbed her arm, grabbed his gun from behind him, and fired. And had Dr. Dietz taken the trouble to explore these possibilities with the defendant, he would have noticed that the shirt the defendant wore at the time of the murder had blood spatters on the shirt tails a fact that would cause a reasonable, objective mind to at least explore the possibility that the defendant's actions spoke louder than his contradictory, exculpatory words, and that those actions described a premeditated murder committed by means of lying in wait. The evidence stands as conclusive proof that the defendant murdered Rebecca Schaefer in cold blood by means of lying in wait. There's no question that Robert Bardo shot and killed Rebecca Schaefer. But to reach a verdict, there are some crucial questions that still must be answered. To what degree was Bardo responsible for his actions? Was he capable of planning a murder? And did he intend to kill Rebecca Schaefer? Just moments after the prosecutor and the defense attorney delivered their closing arguments, Judge Dino Fulgoni was ready with his decision. If you look at this case from the standpoint of the physical facts and the physical facts alone, I think it is very clear that this is a killing by lying in wait. We have a young lady who answers the door to her apartment house. The calm doesn't work. She goes to the apartment door and she is shot. <laughs> The circumstances, as testified by Ms. Marta, are that she heard a buzzer. That's her testimony now at the preliminary hearing. She said she wasn't sure, but she thought she had. And that she heard the victim leave her apartment, walk past her apartment, that she paralleled her walk, that she walked to the front door of the apartment house that very, very shortly after she heard the last step, she said a second or a split second, at the preliminary hearing was a second or a second and a half, something of that nature, there was a shot. Clearly not enough time for any conversation to occur. 
It implies that somebody rang the bell for the purpose of luring her out of her apartment so that she could be killed. I find that Dr. Dietz's opinion is flawed, it is biased. There are a number of examples of bias that I could point out. If you'll recall the testimony he gave when I asked him whether it wasn't a good practice of a forensic psychiatrist to first let the defendant talk so that he gets his entire story out and then go back and uh, attack him with contradictions, with inconsistencies to see how they hold up. He admits that that is the appropriate practice. Yet he did not do this in his case, in this case. He repeatedly interpreted conduct that had any similarity whatsoever with schizophrenia as a symptom of schizophrenia and admitted that this was a danger in an analysis of a criminal defendant. The defendant had ambivalent feelings toward Rebecca Schaefer and that is understandable. What I fail to see is pathological ambivalence in this case. I'm not saying that the defendant is a normal person. The defendant is not a normal person. The defendant has some kind of a mental disorder or problem. The defendant may even have schizophrenia of some sort. And I'll even give him the benefit of the doubt and consider him to have some kind or degree of schizophrenia. But the doctor himself admitted that schizophrenics can premeditate, that they can lie in wait, and they can intend to kill. As a matter of fact, Mr. Galindo conceded that the defendant had the capacity to intend to kill, the capacity to premeditate, and the capacity to lie in wait. The point is, what happened at that doorway? Did he, in fact, lie in wait? Did he premeditate? Did he intend to kill? Obviously, he intended to kill. There is no question in anyone's mind that he intended to kill. But all that gives rise to a naked intent to kill is second-degree murder. What about first-degree murder? Did he premeditate and deliberate? Obviously, he premeditated and deliberated, perhaps even excessively, before he came to California. He had the full fledged intent to kill, his letter to Arlene, wherein he speaks of a mission that you're going to hear about, you're going to hate me for it, etc. He premeditated. He considered carefully the reasons for and against the killing, and then, having considered them, decided to kill. Is there anything distorted, so distorted about his motivation, that would compel me to say that he cannot premeditate and deliberate? And the answer is no. He has no command hallucinations. I watched that tape yesterday of Dr. Dietz interrogating him. And in that tape, his responses were relevant. He understood every single question. If he had hallucinations, he had them when he was 15 years old. If he had them when he was 15 years old, they do not affect his conduct today. There is no delusionary content to his thought. All I see is a hope that Rebecca Schaefer will like him. The point is, it's my job to make a determination as to how serious this defendant's mental condition is, how it affects him, and more importantly, how it affected him on the day of the killing. You have a man who's been planning and premeditating to kill someone. He goes to her door, and the encounter is pleasant. What he wants now, after thinking about it for a half hour to an hour, is another pleasant encounter. He goes there, and the encounter is not pleasant. He has already formed an intent to kill as a result of premeditation and deliberation. It's been thought out. He has decided to do it. He's bought a gun for the purpose. He's bought a bus ticket. He's taken the bus. He's come over there. He's loaded the gun prior to the first visit. 
He's ready to kill. He has considered the reasons for and against it, and having done so, he has decided to kill. He goes up there and finds that this momentary niceness that he perceived is an illusion. She really is arrogant. And then kills. Are we to believe this is not premeditated? I think the time has come to make a decision. I find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, uh, both as premeditated and lying in wait. And I find the special circumstance of lying in wait and that he killed intentionally while lying in wait to be true. After the trial ended, we spoke with the attorneys in the case. Prosecutor Marsha Clark said the videotape of Robert Bardo showed that the defendant well understood the charges, but thought that he'd get away with murder. Defense attorney Steve Galindo said that Judge Dino Fogoni revealed that he had, in the attorney's words, lost his objectivity, attacking instead of just questioning the defense witnesses. As for Dana and Vincent Schaefer, they joined a support group for parents of murdered children, and they became leaders in Oregon's gun control movement. On December 20th, 1991, Judge Fulgoni sentenced Robert Bardo to life in prison without the possibility of parole, the maximum sentence for first-degree murder. The defense is appealing the verdict. Thanks for being with us. For Court TV, I'm Fred Graham.